Hello and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Amy Robertson. I'm the Science Coordinator for the partnership. And we're very happy to have Dr. Helen Poulis with us here today. Uh, the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative has one of the one of the things we're looking into is what species or ecosystems or other things can be monitored to help us understand the effects of climate change on natural resources, species, and ecosystems so that we can um, understand these changes and um, understand when it may be time to take action, uh, whether they're adaptation actions or changing management, um, that sort of thing. And so we're sort of exploring some of the different ways that this can be done. And so we've asked Dr. Helen Poulis to join us today to talk about uh, biodiversity as a metric of ecosystem resilience to climate change. Helen's research focuses on developing risk management and decision support tools for sustainable forest and ecosystem management. She's been working in the Southwest for the last 14 years, exploring local, landscape, and regional scale tree diversity patterns and species turnover along environmental gradients of Sky Island systems. Helen is both a field biologist and a data mining expert, which she uses for developing decision support tools that can be readily implemented by policymakers and on the ground by land managers. She holds a master's degree in geography from the Pennsylvania State University and a PhD from Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. And she is currently part of the Wesleyan University's College of the Environment. So welcome to all of you, and especially welcome to Helen. Thanks for being with us today, and I will hand things over to you for your presentation. Great. Well, thank you so much, and thanks to all of you for, for listening today. This is a, a really exciting topic that I have been interested in for a really long time, so thank you for providing me the opportunity to, to talk about it today. And so I just want to start off with sort of some very basic definitions of biodiversity and a little bit about sort of how the term came into being. And so it was originally used in a popular uh, publication in 1968 by, by Raymond Dasman on, on, in a book called A Different Kind of Country. And then um, its contracted form, biodiversity, is attributed to E.O. Wilson, who used it for the first time when he um, used it in the title of a proceeding from the National Forum on Biological Diversity. However, of course, it is also the topic or the title of his, one of his very famous books. And so the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, defines it as the variability among living organisms from all sources and the ecological complexes of which they are a part. So this includes diversity within species, between species, and across ecosystems. And so my next slide, I just want to show you sort of the four main types of diversity that we think about. And my focus is really on population, community, slash ecosystem level, and landscape diversity. But genetic diversity is also very important. So when we talk about heterozygosity or polymorphism, um, that's a really important conservation topic because it influences the ecosystem functions of, of inbreeding, gene flow, genetic drift. Um, you know, population level diversity is really thought about when we think about abundance or density of species. Um, and it's manifest in a couple of different ways. Um, and, it, and it can influence ecosystem function in, in terms of uh, population growth, mortality, and population fluctuations, which are also, of course, a very high conservation concern. Um, then when we think about the community or ecosystem level, we can start to think about things like species richness. Um, endemic species, invasive species. Um, and that can be quantified by looking at different types of vegetation types, looking at certain types of species, which are especially important in maintaining uh, trophic level structures. And so that is an important influence on patch dynamics, nutrient cycling, trophic cascades. Those are all important elements of ecosystem function. And then finally, when we think about landscape diversity, we can think about how diversity lays out across multiple habitat types or across multiple patches, and then also how species are dis distributed across landscapes and regions. And so that's when these elements of connectivity and fragmentation become really important because they can consequently influence ecosystem functions such as energy flow, nutrient cycling, 
recycling and disservice regime. And so that's just a general overview of the different kinds of diversity that we might be thinking about. And then I wanted to talk about just sort of classical estimates of diversity. And this goes back to the 50s from R.H. Whitaker's work, where we talk about alpha diversity, beta diversity, and gamma diversity. So when we talk about alpha diversity, it's really species richness, so the diversity of individual sample units. So how many species do you find at a particular location? Now, beta diversity is looking at changes or turnover in diversity among different locations or sample units, right? So how much compositional variation do you see at one site relative to another site or in one vegetation type relative to another vegetation type? So this is very important when we think about things like gradients, for example, or when you think about spatial change in diversity. Um, and then finally, gamma diversity is really when we think about this thing of landscape diversity. So overall diversity of a set of sample units. So for example, if I went out and I sampled a mountain range and I went to a whole bunch of different places and then I compared that to how the species richness of that site to another mountain range, that would be something like gamma diversity. So I want to start off with an example from my research, and um, this is from my dissertation research in the Chihuahuan Desert Borderlands, which you see right here across the Texas um, Coahuila uh, border. And this is a picture here in the corner of the Sierra del Carmen. Um, and what you can see here is when you look at this picture, you see high variation in topographic conditions over short geographical dis distances. So a lot of times in the southwest in these sky island systems like this, you can think about vertical stacking of biotic communities, right? So you can see, for example, um, this south-facing face slope has very different vegetation than, say, the slope on the other side of this north-facing slope that receives a lot more shade. And so I was interested in understanding how tree distribution and diversity patterns varied across three mountain ranges in this region, in the Davis Mountains, Big Bend National Park, and the Madera del Carmen, just across the border in Mexico. And so I installed 600 permanent monitoring plots using a systematic sampling grid to capture the topographic variability in site conditions. I used standard forest inventory methods of six circular fixed area plots, and I identified this tree species in each of those plots and measured a variety of different types of attributes for each of those trees. And then I also took field data uh, about environmental conditions, as well as data from a digital elevation model to try to understand what topographic or environmental conditions existed at each of my sample plots. And then for the analysis, I took species abundance data and the topographic data in order to do three things. One, identify the different vegetation types that were dominant in this area. Two, identify the species environment relationships. So what sorts of environmental settings hosted what types of species or what types of vegetation. And then also, what types of environmental settings hosted high diversity or low diversity. And so I did that basically using a variety of different um, tools. And the first one was I just basically took the species abundance data and I did cluster analysis to identify the different vegetation types. Then I used classification and regression trees and performed a form of a gradient analysis to try to look at the types of settings that hosted different types of vegetation. And then I did the same thing over here, and this is a very similar iteration. I just simply calculated diversity indices from the abundance data. And I used that with the topographic data for each plot. And I performed a classification and regression tree to then identify what sites or what environmental conditions hosted high diversity or low diversity across the landscape. And then I did a, a diversity analysis where I looked at alpha, beta, and gamma diversity um, using rarefaction. And basically, rarefaction, what it does is there are certain vegetation types that are very rare. And so I had fewer plots in certain locations than in others. Where, or like, for example, gallery forests are a rare element of the landscape versus pinion juniper forest is a much more common element of the landscape. So I had different sample sizes. So I used rarefaction to account for that based on the idea of a species area relationship. And I looked at alpha diversity for each vegetation type. 
data diversity or species turnover among vegetation types. So what degree did different vegetation types share species? And then gamma diversity or landscape diversity. Which mountain ranges have the highest species richness? And what I found was that there were nine dominant forest types, and they were sort of grouped into two different categories. Tolerant species that were found on dry sites with high sunlight up on upper topographic positions or ridge tops. And they were distributed across the elevation gradient from low to high elevation. So low elevation dry sites had emery oak forest. High elevation dry sites had ting and pine forest. Then there were also four wet site specialists, music site specialists, that liked shady valley bottoms. And they were likewise distributed across the elevation gradient from low to high elevation. So low elevation valley bottoms had mostly grave oak forest, um, whereas high elevation valley bottoms were comprised of cypress fir forest. And so when we look at the diversity of these different, of these different species, you can see that the wet site or the music site specialists had much higher diversity, so SOBs is the rarefied species richness, okay? And so basically, and the number of samples is the number of my plots. So you can see here that wet, wetter, or valley bottoms had high diversity. Extreme sites had lower diversity. Now, that's really important when we think about alpha diversity because it shows you that rare vegetation types had high species richness. So that's really important when you're thinking about that in a conservation context. However, when we look at beta diversity, we see that music sites and extreme sites actually share few species. So when you look at, um, for example, um, gray oak forest and oak pinion juniper forest, they share a lot of species. Okay? And, um, and likewise, ponderosa pine southwestern white pine forest and cypress fir forest share a lot of species. However, when you look across the music sites and the extreme sites, gallery forest and emery oak forest share few species. Um, gray oak forest and cypress fir forest share few species. So that's really important when you're thinking about the idea of landscape scale uh, diversity patterns because while you have rare vegetation types that have high alpha diversity, they represent also a very distinct species complex. And so from a landscape scale perspective, those rare sites are very important, but it's also important to think about them in the matrix of the surrounding landscape, knowing that a variety of different vegetation types is going to be necessary in order to capture the entire species complex. And when we look at gamma diversity, you can see here, and I'm just going to go ahead and put the X here on top of this, um, but basically what you see here is the largest mountain range is here. This is the smallest mountain range. So island size is really not the factor that's showing you this pattern of diversity, but rather topographic complexity appears to be very important. So the Madeira del Carmen is, that is from that picture that I showed you earlier is from the Madeira del Carmen. It's very rugged topography, big bend, uh, the Chisos Mountains, not um, as big, but very topographically complex, whereas the Davis Mountains are not as topographically complex. Likewise, precipitation goes sort of from a low to a high, and latitude goes from a low to a high. So topographic complexity, precipitation, and latitude are all important factors influencing gamma diversity in this location. And when you ask how that might compare with other sites, you can see that there is spatial variability. So this is um, from the Chiricahua National Monument in southeastern Arizona. And what you see here is actually that juniper oak forests have the highest diversity, followed by some of these gallery forest types that you see down here. So what that means is that this isn't the case for everywhere. And so that's really important to understand when we think about the spatial distribution of species richness or the spatial distribution of alpha diversity across the southwest. So um, basically, we can see here that the southwest from um, this picture has a lot of species. And this is um, across um, plants and vertebrates. It also has a lot, quite a few endemics. and a lot of species at risk. And so this was a map that was refined by the Nature Conservancy um, subsequently. And you can see here the importance of island systems, um, mountain island systems. And so um, the question becomes, OK, well, these, the, this is where we have high diversity sites. The question is, 
well, what types of environmental conditions within those sites host high species richness or high beta diversity, high turnover, or high difference, large scale differences among vegetation types within the same landscape. Um, and so just to continue on to sort of describe this concept of diversity is um, Dave Tillman has lots and lots of years of research looking at this question. And, and it appears from this study and many others that a system stability is related to diversity. And so what you see is resistance to, to perturbation and the speed of recovery of systems has to do with diversity. And so places that have more diversity are more resistant to drought, and they recover more quickly from drought. And they also continue to be productive under drought, more productive than places that are species depauperate. So, um, and this relationship appears to hold. So in general, biomass production resource and research consumption increase with diversity across both terrestrial and aquatic systems, which explains why biodiversity as a metric is a really important one for thinking about ecosystem function. So let's look back at this map again and think about these biodiversity hotspots. And then let's look at the following map, um, which is basically showing you, which I'm sure m most of you in this audience already know, that the southwest is going to be particularly affected by climate change, both through an increase in temperature and a drop in precipitation. So the question becomes, what's going to happen to the species? And this is an example from a paper, a science paper by Dawson et al. And it's basically showing you from since the last glacial maximum, real data about what have happened to some different species, contemporary species, in terms of their distributions um, in relationship to climate change that we've observed over the last several thousand years. And what you can see is some species simply tolerate it. Others move to other habitats. Others migrate to other mountain ranges. And some simply can't hack it and become extinct. And so there are also different kinds of characteristics about climate change. There's habitat extinction, removal from a particular habitat, local extinction, so it's in one, one place but not in another nearby place where it used to be. Regional extinction, which means it's gone from the region. Functional extinction, meaning that the species is still existing, but not a viable population in terms of its reproduction and trajectory for the future. And then, of course, global, meaning globally gone from this planet. So, um, so when we think about biodiversity, the important thing is that it, so you have these global changes that influence biodiversity. But biodiversity influences species interactions. These are not random things. So if you alter biodiversity, you alter the interactions among species. You alter their abundances. And you'll have some winners, and you'll have some losers. And the losers are going to make new resources available to the residual population, which is ultimately going to affect ecosystem processes and cycle back to affect biodiversity. So I'm not alone here in thinking about biodiversity and the concept of climate change. And there have been quite a few um, different approaches for looking at this question. Um, the historical paleoecological record, of course, is one very fine and detailed record of how species have fluctuated in the past in relationship to climate change or climate variability. Ecophysiological models, so understanding how traits relate to the predisposition of a species um, to survive or die under climate change. And I'm doing quite a bit of work on that as well um, in, in West Texas. And direct observations, so inventories, experimental manipulations, population modeling, and then climate envelope models. So I want to start off by talking about climate envelope models because I think they're a really useful way of thinking about things, but they're fraught with a lot of problems. And so Basically, in the last 10 years, there's been a huge proliferation of this climate envelope modeling method. And I've actually used it in a couple of my own publications. Um, I will tell you that I had a hard time getting those papers published for this very reason, which is that you take presence absence data, so about a species distribution, nothing about abundance, 
just whether or not there is the species is there or not at a particular location. And then you take gridded environmental data in order to try to build a statistical model to try to predict under future climates where you might find a particular species. Right, so trying to predict the range. So Thomas et al. has a very famous paper from a few years back that said that by 2050, 15 to 30 percent of the of species will be faced with extinction according to this climate envelope modeling uh, method. But the issue is, while you can show differences in range or differences in distribution under climate change, it doesn't say anything about influences on ecosystem function. Climate envelope models really ignore a core truth of ecology, which is that species interact with each other and that community composition actually matters. And so diversity metrics can really offer insights into this mechanism through the lens of alpha, beta, and gamma diversity, right? So alpha diversity can tell you things about the spatial and temporal distribution of species richness. Beta diversity can tell you about spatial and temporal species turnover. And gamma diversity can tell you about landscape scale changes and community structure. And so um, identifying hot spots is one step, right? So where are these species rich locations? Um, but identifying regions on the landscape that are susceptible to high species turnover or beta diversity and changes in community structure is another really important element for understanding changes across space and time in species distribution patterns and species complexes in relationship to climate change. So, um, you know, I think there are definitely some gaps in research and some research needs in terms of thinking about alpha diversity. So there are maps that show you sort of where these biodiversity hotspots are in the southwest, and we know that mountains harbor a lot of biodiversity. But which mountains? What environments host these things? What about other places that aren't mountains? Um, and we know a lot about plants, but we don't know that much about other taxa. And then the other really important question is, is sort of about how richness is changing over time, so the temporal component. So we have sort of these static estimates of people going in at one point in time and sampling vegetation or the, or the biota in a particular location, but we don't have a lot of information about change. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential for data aggregation in that, in that field. And you know, I, I, for example, have looked at individual mountain ranges, but it would be wonderful if I could look across multiple mountain ranges at these same kinds of questions in order to identify priorities for conservation and priorities for monitoring. So the second comp component of diversity that I wanted to talk about was beta diversity and thinking about spatial and temporal turnover in species composition. And this is a global map. And basically, from the left to the right, you see changes in scale. It's not particularly that easy to read. But the idea behind it is showing you places that have high turnover. Right, so places that have high turnover over space, right? So in other words, one pixel next to another pixel is very different in species composition um, for, for the globe. So this is really meant to show you a perspective or an idea. I'm going to go into detail now about how I think this idea could be used in the Southwest. And so um, one of the things that I have some experience working with is break Curtis dissimilarities. And basically what you do is you take um, data from a particular location or samples, and you have species abundance information. And basically what you can do with that is then you can create a break Curtis dissimilarity matrix. Um, and what it will show you is how similar a particular site is to another site in terms of species composition. And then you can use ordination to generate a map of your sites across species space. And I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with ordination, and it's been used for a long time. But it still remains a very useful tool. And so the question is, how are these sites different? And in relation to what? What makes them different? So ordination maps look like this in general. And they usually have axes associated with them that can then be linked to environmental predictors using things like Pearson's correlation coefficients and different types of regression. So the idea is to say, OK, we can see here that group A is different in species composition than groups B. Uh, I'm sorry, group C is different than groups A and B. And it's quite different relative to A and B, which are closer in species space. And so this is an example from the Chiricahua National Monument of an ordination figure. And basically what you can see here is that oak, pinion, manzanita vegetation is quite different than 
mid-elevation gallery for us. And you can also see the species, these are species acronyms, um, first name, first two letters of the genus, first two letters of the species, they're quite different in terms of species composition. And then you can use um, correlation to look at how these plots, these are individual plots here that are denoted by vegetation type, um, are real, then related to these environmental variables or environmental predictors. So the next question is, OK, so you have an ordination map that says, OK, these things are different, and they're different in terms of species composition. That's one step in terms of sort of a, a closer, finer tooth comb for understanding differences in species composition among groups. But there are some other um, measures that you can use as well that I'd like to talk about. So the question is, OK, well, how similar is group A from group B and group C in terms of overall species composition? Well, analysis of similarity allows you to look at that question. It's a statistical approach for testing the hypothesis of whether or not sites are the same or different in terms of species composition. And so if the sites are the same, then the similarity within groups will be equal to the similarity between groups. However, if the sites are different, the similarity within groups will be greater in terms of species composition than the similarity between groups. And so these are based on pairwise differences. So if you have, this is an example with two um, types of vegetation or two types of sites. Um, but if you had three or four or five, you would simply do multiple pairwise comparisons to look at the differences among each um, set of groups. And so that tells you simply that species are different. Now the question becomes, which species are responsible for those differences? And um, similarity percentages can get to that information. And so basically, it will indicate which species are responsible for those patterns that we see. So basically, the output is um, a certain species contributes to 50% of the dissimilarity among sites. So um, you can see how uh, diversity and community composition can be related to each other to get at these more detailed ideas of how species are shifting both over space and time. And that's a much more detailed set of information than a climate envelope model that's going to give you presence, absence, and, envir and an environmental predictor and a map. So, um, so then finally, there's another step here that you can use to basically say, OK, well, we have our ordination showing us the map of how these sites are distributed in species space. We can tell whether or not these sites are different, significantly different in species composition. We can then say, well, which species are responsible for those differences? And then we can use Permanova um, to try to figure out what sites and what time steps are different. So if you're using a, a, a time series data set, this would be useful. Or, you can, or if you're using a, um, just a, a spatial data set that has sample sites in different places, you can do that. You can also do both, so you can nest um, time steps and sites. So you can think of this kind of like a mixed model. And so the question that you can answer using Permanova or mixed models is whether or not differences among locations or time steps or, location, or, or locations nested within time sets um, influence uh, diversity and community structure. And so this is just a picture of a paper that I have in press. Um, on fish and dam removal, but it gets at the same thing and it's basically showing you how, um, this is a time step example, but basically it's showing you shifts in a particular species over time and the stars across three different sites. It was related to a dam removal project uh, here in the Northeast. But basically the idea is the stars show you that the time steps are significantly different in terms of both the treatments and the abundances of these different species. So you can see how this builds a much stronger and longer story about how species are changing over time or, in, or across space in relation to in the environment. So that approach really allows you to answer the following questions. How do sites differ from one, of the, one another, either spatially or temporally or both? Um, are the differences that you see significant? 
amongst these different sites or time steps? And then um, which species, sites, and time sets are responsible for these differences. So I think it's a really useful way of thinking about not only shifting patterns of diversity, but um, also then shifting patterns of um, species assemblages. And so um, the last thing I want to really talk to you about is how you might use this in the context of climate change. So obviously, people are interested in thinking about species turn turnover in relationship to climate change. So I wanted to sort of offer a couple of, of methods based on a few recent papers about how you could test whether climate drives spatiotemporal composition, compositional turnover across a landscape. So in other words, can we identify areas that are susceptible to high species turnover from climate change? And so this is based on a paper by Guerra et al. Um, that was just published last year. And um, this is kind of the methodology, and it, and it builds on um, the diagrams that I showed you before. And it involves two different kinds of data. One is community composition data that you can then turn into Bray Curtis dissimilarities, beta diversity, basically. That's, that's what Bray Curtis dissimilarities are a measure of beta diversity. And then you can take contemporary climate data and future climate data to do two things to build um, beta diversity maps for the contemporary climate. So what are locate, where, where are their ecotones, right? Where are their locations with high beta diversity now, today? Then, using the same information, you can use the World Climb AR5 um, predictions, gridded data sets that people use in those climate envelope models all the time with the community composition data to try to get a sense of where in the future are you going to have big shifts in species composition. So, that's a big difference between taking presence absence data from climate envelope models and building a statistical relationship to predict presence or absence in the future. Rather, this is telling you, in the future, here are places that are likely to experience a lot of change. Moreover, with this method that I'm going to talk about in more detail in a minute, you can also then, based on what I showed you in the last few slides, try to figure out what species are associated with that turnover. Right? So that's really important if you think about that a conservation tactic or strategy for climate change adaptation and mitigation in the Southwest. And so basically what you can do is you take the contemporary climate data. These are, these, this data set has like 18 different um, data layers in it. And so there's a lot of multicollinearity in the data set. So typically what people do is they use principal components analysis, which is a form of ordination, to try to figure out what the relevant climate variables are. That's step one. Step two is that there's also a lot of spatial autocorrelation amongst sites, right? So close mountain ranges or close, um, close locations or sites are going to share more species than distant sites. So um, basically you want to build the spatial dis dependency into the model. And so taking both of these together, relevant climatic variables and a distance matrix of spatial dependency, you can create a bio bioclimatic distance matrix for the present and for the future. So you would generate two of these, one for the contemporary climate and one for the future climate. And then you can do coordination, gradient analysis in order to figure out or generate that map of, uh, of species or sites in species space, both for the present climate and for the future climate. And then you can do analysis of similarity, similarity percentage, and permanova to try to figure out if these sites differ in species composition in the present climate and in the future climate, which species are responsible for those differences, and which sites or time steps are responsible for those types of turnover. Okay? With that same ordination, like I said before when I on that diagram where I where the arrows appeared, you can then look at the axes um, or the predictors that of these um, species distribution patterns and um, do Regression analysis, actually this is um, general additive models, which are um, non-parametric and much more flexible than a regular uh, regression model. And you can do that, you can use those um, to actually identify ecotones with high beta diversity both in the present and in the future. And so things with a very high slope will have high beta diversity, and then you can map that because you're using originally, don't forget, a gridded data set. 
up here, right? So you can see how this has some resemblance of a climate envelope model because I am using gridded climate data, but it incorporates a lot more information and it gives a lot more detailed output. So you end up with maps that show high basal diversity both in the present and in the future as a secondary map, and you get insights into species associated with that turnover. If you have temporal data available, you can also look at things like portfolio effects. And this is from a paper by Mellon et al., also from last year, looking at reef fishes. Um, and basically what portfolio effects do is they look at um, stability in community structure at the metapopulation level. So basically, if you can think about a lot of sites that would be distributed across the southwest, um, things that portfolio effects greater than one, basically things that are shaded here, are stable, are stabilizing. So basically, I'm showing you lots of text with descriptions, but the, the take home message is you plot the range of portfolio effects against this gray Curtis dissimilarity, the spatial dissimilarity in species composition over time, and you can get a sense as to which of these communities are stable, okay? Which of these communities are stable? So the idea is um, you're trying to identify stable sites in relation to spatial similarity and community structure. Um, so that's, that's something that, that you can do if you have long-term temporal data. I know that's not always available for, for a lot of places. So in conclusion, really, um, diversity metrics are really useful for understanding both contemporary and future species richness, community structure, and species turnover. Climate change is undoubtedly, has already started, and it will continue to, in the future, stimulate shifts in species ranges, interactions, and ecosystem structure. And um, there are some, some very good tools out there for quantifying and modeling these spatiotemporal changes in diversity that we can use to then inform these adaptation and mitigation efforts for maintaining biodiversity and ecosystem structure in, in a very fragile landscape like the Southwest that, that will likely be quite heavily affected by climate change. And so with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Great. Thanks so much, Helen. Uh, we really appreciate your making the time to pull this together and talk to us today. So we do want to take questions from the audience. Um, if you all, there's a bar at the top of your WebEx screen, and you can click on the participants box. Uh, that will open a, a little box where you have the option to raise your hand. Um, so if you have questions, um, please go ahead and, and raise your hand. And uh, while we're waiting for folks to uh, sort that out, um, Helen, I, I'll go ahead and ask you a question. Um, I'm wondering if you can um, give us some additional examples of how um, on-the-ground managers might use this kind of information to uh, inform their actions. Well, I mean, the, the great thing about this is that it has a map output, right? And so you can basically um, intersect both the, the historical or the contemporary, I'm sorry, the contemporary biodiversity map and, and sort of say, okay, well, these are places that have always had a lot of species turnover with the future map. And then say, oh, you know what, here are places, here are new places that are going to that are going to experience species, high species turnover in the future. These are places that we definitely want to think about conservation strategies for, or think about things like assisted migrations, or think about maximizing connectivity um, so in, in a conservation framework. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, the, the advantage of, of looking at the, the community structure element of this is then you can say, oh, you know what, these are the turnover is responsible, um, a certain, this certain species is responsible for this turnover. So this might be a species of a conservation concern. Right, right, great. Um, I, I realize folks may um, not have used WebEx before, so they may be unfamiliar uh, with the raising the hand option. So um, you also have the option to just unmute yourself. Um, to do that, you can press star six and um, go ahead and ask a question. Hi, this is Don Falk. I, I did raise my hand. 
Oh, I'm not seeing it. <laughs> I, I saw it. I actually, they, they, there were like three or four of them that came. Okay. Well, again. Helen, it may yeah. be that since I'm not set up as the host for this one, maybe Helen, you can see them. Then you could go ahead and call on folks. Okay. I'm not sure. So we'll start with Don. And can but, you see them? I'm not so, sure. I, I just saw it like appear, and then I don't know. Okay. Well, Don, please go ahead, and then we'll we'll figure it out from there. <laughs> Thank, so first of all, Helen, thanks. That was just fabulous. Really, really interesting, engaging work, right on point. Um, very impressed with it. I have a question for you about ecological disturbance, which I know you've worked on quite a bit, but didn't mm -hmm. really address in this webinar. And I wonder if you could talk about that axis of that that has the potential to both destabilize or reorganize communities. Yeah. Um, so you know, I have a lot of friends that work with um, process-based models like Landis, for example, and there's some folks out at the Pacific Northwest that are specifically trying to do a lot of this work for um, for, for trees as well. And I think that's, you know, that's obviously something that, um, so for example, Landis 2, you can incorporate, there is a biodiversity um, module in it, and you can incorporate those kinds of, those kinds of things, you know, in a, in a spatially explicit process-based model. Um, so that's something that I didn't, you know, there's only so many things I could talk about, but that's sort of how I was thinking of of approaching that question, right? Is sort of looking at that disturbance element, but in in a spatially explicit framework like um, like Landis. I guess specifically, do you um, do you see ways that including disturbance could allow you to refine the modeling of interactions among species, for example? Yeah, where some absolutely. May... So um, I've also done quite a bit of ordination where we um, where we look at, for example, um, I've, I've done it on time series data with fire, right? So looking at pre-fire, post-fire, one year, five year, kind of the standard sort of um, fire sampling time, time span, right? And then I've, I've ordinated species composition um, matrices in that framework. And so you could do the same kind of thing. I mean, basically what you would do is you'd have your species composition data, um, and then you could make break Curtis to similarity matrices and then go ahead and look at how disturbance is overlaying on top of that. Um, and I, I assume, and I mean, sort of, I'm not entirely certain how, how this would, I'd have to think about it more, but I would assume that you could incorporate that element as well into these, into these change um, maps. Great, thank you. Great. Thanks, Don. Um, so again, I'm not sure the hand raise button is working that well for us. So if you have a question, go ahead and press star six on your phone, unmute yourself, and let us know that you're there. Hello? Oh, okay. I actually, sorry. I, I now see hand raising. Okay. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> yes? Hello. Hi, this is uh, Paul Barrett out in Albuquerque. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yep. Paul. Okay. Hey, hey Amy. Um, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm interested in a couple of the citations, and particularly the Garin et al. Uh, do you have a uh, – is that, is that the Australian research group? Yes. Yes, it is. And I actually had mentioned to Amy before we, we started that I have both of those papers and would be happy to either distribute them to Amy for her to give out to the group, or if you email me, which my email is on this thing a couple of different times, I will be happy to send it to you. But yeah, they, um, you know, I, I did a, a, a pretty thorough review kind of on this biodiversity literature, and I really appreciated their approach because it got at kind of these fine scale questions that a lot of this sort of huge array of climate envelope modeling pr approach uh, procedures doesn't get at. Okay, well thank you. I'll I'll track down the article through Amy or through NCTC or something. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, or you can just email me. I'll give it to you. I've got it sitting here on my desktop. Okay. All right. I'll do that. Thanks. Thanks for your question, Paul. And I think someone else was speaking up previously. Any other questions? Hello. I see, I, yes. yes, hello. Hi, uh, this is Jurgen Hoard in Mexico. Uh, thank you, Helen, for such a great presentation. Uh, you, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I was uh, wondering, uh, after having worked in, in the region and seeing your work, uh, and uh, something that I wonder if, if you looked into was to incorporate information that exists for Mexico in terms of how species may change, particularly species turnover for the arid areas in, in northern Mexico. In particular, there's a really interesting work by 
uh, Townsend Peterson from the National History Museum in Kansas together sure, with uh -huh. several researchers. And, and it would be really nice, and I think that it would be amazing if you could uh, look into how to bring the information not so much at the national scale, which you did a great job, but more how about at the North American scale. Yeah, that absolutely. Can help us move politicians, move people. There is already a lot of, of work, good work, and say, for instance, with um, – uh, the work that Amy and others are doing in, in the Big Bend and on the Mexican side, it would help us uh, get things rolling. I, I think that would be amazing if, you, if at some point you could incorporate that type of information. And, Absolutely. And, so, go ahead. Or, yeah, yeah, and I wondered if you had already looked into it, what hurdles are you facing to, to, to provide that overall North American perspective, including even right. Canada at some point? Right. So, um, so you know, this is kind of a, a first step for me, this, this presentation in terms of thinking about this, but it is something that I've been thinking about for a long time, and I'll tell the same story to you that I told to Amy, which was when I published my dissertation research, one of the reviewers said, oh, well, you know, why didn't you do this for the whole Sierra Madre, right, o mm -hmm. Oriental? <laughs> and I know, well, that's nice. <laughs> I spent nine months in the field doing this piece of the, of, of, of the work. And so, but that really pushed me or, or made me think about sort of how you would actually think about the distribution of diversity across the larger Sierra Madre, you know, at, at landscape, right, both the Oriental and Occidental, right, mm -hmm. um, and thinking about that in, in, in a larger scale framework. And I, I did sort of some, some jumping around trying to figure out where I might get data sets for that, but that was a, a barrier for me, you know, and so I never took off. And I saw this as a real opportunity to, to try to, to generate some some context to think about that question because, of course, these ranges are, are you know, binational. You know, they, they go from southern Mexico all the way into these Sky Island broken up systems where, and as you know, the center of diversity of these systems is really in Mexico. Right. Yeah, yeah. So Something I would certainly may... be interested in yeah. that. I'll be happy to help you with key contacts, but something, looking at your information where you have that series of years and how it would affect in different locations throughout the world. You know, you have like several bands right. of images. What kept, caught my attention was that, at least under this study, um, most of the change uh, in terms of, of species turnover will take place in the arid areas of northern Mexico. Yet, right. Mm -hmm. The maps you showed hardly pointed out to that area, and for us, it is the hottest area where, sure. where change is expected to happen. So I think lots of really interesting things may may emerge as you do that. And and if we can, if I can be of any help, please count on that. That would be wonderful because the you know the the World Climate Database it's a, it's a global data set, and I've worked with it before for some of this climate envelope modeling. So it's it's really not that difficult to work with. But the, the, the big barrier is where do I get community composition data for Mexico? And I know that you have something similar to like FIA, the forest, you know, data for Forest Service, but again, it's it's hard to get your hands on. So I would love to continue this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Great. We have time uh, for some more questions. Again, you'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. All right, well, while folks are thinking, Helen, I've got another one for you. Um, okay. Um, in thinking about doing this at larger scales, of course, the landscape conservation cooperatives are looking at that broad landscape scale, um, some of them quite large, like ours in the desert. Um, and so to do something like this for that entire geographic area, you know, how big an endeavor is that? Is that something that's, you know, in terms of time and, and resources and, and finances, you know, what kind of an investment is that? So that would be part A. And, and part B is um, what do you envision, like, in terms of sort of um, ground truthing? And is this something to be revisited over time, um, to be monitored over time, to see if it's really tracking actual changes? Or So first of all, that landscape question. And then secondly, like, how do we use this information over time? Right. And so... Um you know that was really what I what I, what I was hoping to to find out is you know it 
if there are data available of this type, you know, it's a, it's a data aggregation issue. So um, to, rather than, you know, obviously it would be great to go out and do a bunch of field work and go inventory a bunch of things, but I think that there may actually be disparate data sets in a lot of these different places um, that could be used to this end. Um, and so, um, and then, you know, obviously um, from a diversity context, if you're dealing with field-based data, the, the ground truthing effort um, might not, what you could certainly ground truth a contemporary map, right? But the future map, it would be very difficult to, to, to monitor at this point in time unless you did multi-temporal stuff. But that would be the other point is that, you know, going out perhaps using using this diversity metric or diversity, uh, this approach for looking at diversity um, to try to identify lo locations or ecotones with high, high turnover, which is good, but then also um, I'll go to places that, that potentially could have high turnover in the future, and then going out and then um, and then prioritizing them for sort of this temporal component, right? So, um, you know, I see sort of the potential products out of this as being a way to focus some of those efforts that you're talking about. So, um, I think the initial step in terms of you know performing these types of analyses um, could be done relatively inexpensively if you can if you can find people who are willing to collaborate and, and contribute data. Um, and then the second part, though, would be then, okay, now we know where these locations are that are important, and so now let's go back um, and, 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 and try to monitor them, you know, sort of as a, as a monitoring network of, of crucial locations, right, that could be highly affected by climate change. Mm -hmm. that's, so, I, I think that's that very interesting. Question? Yeah, and so um, in thinking about like a monitoring effort, so on that last that last sentence, um, monitoring these areas that we predict to be biodiversity hotspots, um, <clears throat> you know, is that, you know, how cost effective is that then? Like, is create creating some kind of biodiversity indices, or you know, what do you what might that look like? Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would think that you would just simply go in and do the same kinds of of inventories. Over time, so like for example, um, there have been a lot of, of there's a, Kelly and Goulden is a piece of paper that came out I think late 2000s, and they simply just went back in Southern California to the same mountain range and they looked at species marching up slope, and so they went back to the same locations and then they found that those species that were at these plots, you know, in the 50s were no longer there; they had moved up, you know, hundreds of meters. In elevation, and so I can see that being the kind of um, you know basically installing some monitoring plots right in some of these locations, and then going back at you know however many year intervals to try to 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 look at changes over time. And I know, for example, there was a recent map that came out out of the University of Arizona. Oh no, it was actually UCSB. There was a, a, stu a student that graduated just last year, and he actually generated some maps for Arizona and New Mexico to identify places with high tree mortality. So I think you could look at, you know, working in, in that context. So like, okay, well, these are places that are, that are experiencing high tree mortality, which is an indicator of this change, right? Um, and then using that in suite with some of these other things, saying, okay, well, let's see what's going on in terms of beta diversity in those places. Oh, you know what? Those are places with high beta diversity. Okay, we better think about looking at these places as a, as a priority for, for monitoring and for thinking about strategies that we can use to ensure that these populations or these species continue to exist into the future. Right. Great. Thank you. All right. We still have time for maybe one, one more question or so. Um, if anyone has a question, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, Amy and Helen. Mark Kybe here. Can you hear me? Hi, Mark. Hi, Helen. Uh, very thought-provoking presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, I was, uh, as I was listening along, I, I was thinking of this rapidly emerging body of science and some of it relating to functional plant groups. And I was thinking that there may be some predictive uh, possibilities here with your analysis to identify some species that would make up uh, functional plant groups for the future and uh, you know that might be something we could incorporate into our management uh, some of the adaptation 
strategies and mitigation. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the one of the other parts of the analysis that I didn't talk about from that um Guarin paper is that they actually they looked at um they, they looked at that and they actually um tried to build a model to predict certain uh, on the family level. So looking uh -huh. at plant families that were so it was and of course, you know, I I wasn't sure how much time I had to talk, but that could certainly be, uh, and they used a separate data set, a seed, a seed big data set, um, to try to identify plant families based on those outputs of the ordination axes um, then, and the regression analyses, then they, they basically, they, they did a separate analysis on the, on the eigenve eigenvectors um, uh, from, the, from the ordination analysis to then um, look at the relationship between those predictors of change or diversity and then these plant families and try to figure out which plant families were likely to experience that turnover effect. And so um, there's certainly um, that option. And then I know um, as well a lot of these folks out in the Pacific Northwest are actually, that's the framework they're working in is in, is in these functional groups. I think the challenge though with that is that um, sometimes with these functional groups, um, you have to be careful in terms of translating that to management. At least that's what I can understand from um, certain, like, evergreen needle forests that are highly predisposed to, to climate change, then land managers are like, well, what is that, you know? So um, that's the, but I think that there are, there are um, a variety of different models that, that will allow you to either look at the family level to try to predict or at that functional group level like you were talking about. Fantastic. L looking forward to more of these uh, publications from you. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. All right. I think we we could take one more if there's any more questions out there. Remember, if you want to ask a question, to press star six to unmute yourself. Hello. 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 Yeah. Hi. This is Jerry Hillier. I'm I'm out in southern Nevada right now, and unfortunately, I didn't have the benefit of being able to take notes because I'm in my vehicle and. And all is the is there a written part uh, for your presentation today um, uh, script and all that you could make available um, to us there so that I could uh, actually glean some more permanence from uh, what you said? It was an interesting presentation, and I'd like to have the benefit of being able to share it with my uh, group of people. Sure, Jerry. Um, thanks for joining us. There's not going to be a written transcript, but that we are recording this, and it will be available on the desert. Uh, LCC YouTube channel um, probably sometime next week, so it'll be available as a video. And then there are some papers. Okay. There's some papers um, that some published papers that um, uh, Helen has referenced that that will include um, those citations as well, so that you can find the information. Okay. Well, I, I heard all of the uh, the presentation there. Unfortunately, I just wasn't able to. Uh, take my eyes off the road there long enough to take some notes. So. <laughs> no worries. No worries. That's one of the reasons uh, we record these is, um, you know, we can never find a time that's convenient for everyone, so we uh, make it available um, for folks in the future as well. So. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I'll look for that from uh, Genevieve. Good. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. All right, folks. Well, um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And again, special thanks uh, to Helen uh, for this very interesting uh, presentation and discussion. Thank so, you uh, very much for the opportunity. It was it was thought provoking for me too. Thanks so much. Great. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, and uh, have a wonderful day. And we hope to be talking to you again soon. Victoria, Take care. just what? Victoria. Oh, sure. Just Go ahead. Question. Uh, how can we? get in touch with uh, Helen to look up, for instance, about the Mexico, Mexico's information or participation uh, that could be, that could enhance her work, help her work. Helen, are you still there? Yep, I'm there. You um, want to go yeah, back to the slide with your email address? Yeah, oh, it's like, you. but for some reason my, um, well, can you maybe see my There it is at the bottom, at the bottom. Can you see it, Jurgen? Um, I can, let me go to the top again, and it's at the top in a different spot, sorry. so. Sorry for putting but, you through. And then, um, yeah, email me, and um, we can we can Skype as well, because you're a, you're a, you're in Mexico, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, writing it very quickly down. Okay. And and others, if you want to contact Helen, there's her uh, email address there on the screen. Thank you very much. It done. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Victoria, for hosting and recording today. Thank and you all. I I think I think we're done. Great. Thank you so much.